You're tuned in to Night Vision Radio, exposing the truth one secret at a time. Prepare yourself as we explore the shadow worlds of suppressed history, secret knowledge, forbidden religion, and shine a light on the conspiracies to keep it all from us. Night Vision Radio. Welcome to Night Vision Radio, everyone. I am your host, Renee Barnett. So glad that you could join me tonight because I'm so excited about tonight's show. You all know my favorite subject uh, will be the big overarching subject area of the Renless Chateau Mysteries. So I'm really excited about tonight's guest. But before I introduce him, uh, I want to remind everyone out there, all you uh, Ren buffs that we are having a big meetup in the, the first week of May in the Renla Chateau, Renla Ban area. And we're going to be planning some activities. I'm going to be screening my film uh, Bloodline for its 10 year anniversary. Unbelievable. It was uh, released 10 years ago in May. So it's, it's really quite wild to think that it's been that many years. And I will be there. Uh, my producer partner and the director of the film Bruce Burgess will be there and we will be taking questions after the film and catching all the slings and arrows you want you want to throw at us <laughs> but also we'll be explaining uh, what happens subsequent to the film's delivery and what we're up to now also uh, we're going to be screening uh, Richard Stanley's film The Other World L'Autre Monde and I'll be putting up information about that on my Facebook page, as well as on uh, a Facebook page that I've set up called Rennie Union 2018. Rennie Union 2018. So go there if you're interested and um, apply to join, and I will approve your application there. And also, uh, just keep an eye on that page and on my Facebook page, and I'll let you know any activities that we set up. We, it, it may end up that we have a day or two of speakers. I'm just not sure uh, what's going on. This was this is the first time I think I've gone, actually, second time I've gone that I haven't taken a tour group with me, and I'm not actually working this time. I'm going for my own enjoyment, and I always thought, what a wonderful idea it would be if we all showed up at once, all uh, people that are interested in the subject area. Uh, so I know that there's lots of researchers and authors, and of course, you know, there are authors in the area that live there right now. You know, Henry, Henry Lincoln is still in the area. He lives in Ren Laban, and Tim Wallace Murphy is in Esperanza. So We've got a, a wealth of, of, of uh, information there just waiting for us and hopefully a great exchange of ideas the first week of May. So let me know if you're interested. Um, and I'll give you all the information that I have. But this is not a tour. I'm not charging anything. I'm just saying, hey, come on over and let's all get together at the same time. Share ideas and who knows, maybe we can put together some of these missing puzzle pieces. Which is what I'm really counting on my guests tonight uh, to do for us. Now, I have to thank uh, our mutual friend, Sandra Hamlet, uh, who is the... Um, publisher of Redesium. It's a journal uh, which is in print, but it's also a website on basically Ren Studies. That's redesium.com, R-H-E-D-E-S-I-U-M.com. So I really want to thank Sandy, and I see that she's lurking there in the chat room, so she's listening to me as I'm going to... Um, get uh, some information off her website and read it to you in just a moment right after I, I introduce my esteemed guest who is an American geologist and author researcher in Paris, Mr. John Saul. 
Thanks so much, John, for joining us tonight. I know, or this morning for you. I know it is very, very early in Paris. It says 4.35 on my screen here. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for getting up at this at the terrible, ungodly hour of 4.30 a.m. Uh, to talk with us about these subjects. Uh, I want to direct everyone while we're while they're listening as well to your website, which is tomebooks2.com, tomebooks2.com, that's T-O-M-E books books2.com, and check out John's books. You can buy them right directly off the website, as, as some of my friends did this week, I know. And that's what I really want to talk about are some of those books. And also, uh, we want to get into what John's working on now or his latest manuscript, which will soon be published. And it is a look into, among other things. Now, I don't know a lot about it. I've only been given very sketchy information. Uh, But I'm going to try to see if I can get a sneak peek at some of that material tonight on this show. And I believe it's an investigation into... uh, the Renle Chateau uh, affair with Pierre Plantard and Philip de Cherisy. Is that roughly what your new manuscript oh, is? That's certainly, that's certainly much of it, yes. Oh, good, good, good. We'll <laughs> save that for a little bit later. We'll make them wait for that. But um, as I said, uh, you know, I was just talking about Renle Chateau. One of the people that I know is coming uh, because we've been making plans all uh for about the last year to meet up there again is Sandra Hamlet from Rhodesium. And right now I'm looking at her website where she begins uh, talking about sort of the story uh, behind the all the hubbub uh, about Renless Chateau. If I could just read just uh, a little bit uh, from the very top of her uh of her page here. Catholic priest Berenger Saunier died in 1917, leaving behind the secret of his fabulous wealth. Only his housekeeper, Marie Denarnot, knew the secret, and she promised to reveal it to Noel Corbu on her deathbed. She said that it would make him very powerful. Sadly, she died without divulging the secret in 1953. Speculation was rife after her death regarding the source of the priest's money. Was he a common criminal selling masses illegally? Or given the local history, had he found a colossal archaeological treasure, perhaps the legendary lost Visigothic gold? Or had Saunier been blackmailing the church with some terrible secret. The evidence that points to the last possibility is Saunier's confession on his deathbed, so shocking that the priest who heard it allegedly denied him absolution and last rites. A village elder later confirmed that he had attended Sunday school in the village when he was younger. He said that Marie, after the death of Saunier, often taught Catholicism in the school. According to the elder, Once after an hour of class, when she finished, she closed the book, looked at the children and said, my poor kids, if you only knew. Whatever did she mean? And that's on Rhodesium.com. Take a look for yourself and see Sandy's other wonderful material. But now I'm wondering, now I want to call everyone's attention to a book that you wrote um, in, or compiled in 1985, Renless Chateau, a bibliography. I have a copy of it here, and thanks to Sandy, you know, just recently, I just discovered it recently, and I tell you, I've been going through it, John, like crazy, and finding out all sorts of information about uh, Renless Chateau, and I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, who's often been a guest on this show, and people know Gloria Amendola. She's another Wren researcher and author. And we were talking about how kind of refreshing it is to actually go back. And I like the fact that you wrote it in, in 1985 so that we can kind of go back and take a fresh start because there's been a lot of, you know, crazy hoaxes and obfuscation uh, going on since that time. And it's kind of nice to go back to the beginning and see what existed, you know, right around the time, right after Holy Blood, Holy Grail came out in 1982. So how did you get into this? How did you decide to do that work? 
Well, first of all, it started the way many things start uh, these days. I saw a television program uh, that was uh, Henry Lincoln's uh, show on the BBC. Chronicles. And uh, I uh, missed some of the details at the beginning, at the end. So I wrote a letter very simply, uh, Henry Lincoln, BBC London. And it got to him. And he got back to me. Uh, he told me later on that he only got back to two people. He had a lot of mail. One was a, uh, a young girl who said, uh, well, have you looked at the, uh, the ground there? Have you looked at uh, the five points? It seems to be a star there. And uh, I was the other one because I said I was a geologist and uh, I was reasonably good at finding things out in the field. And I didn't really understand what he was up to, but uh, if he wanted to contact me, he could. And sure enough, he did. And uh, I went down there once and didn't really understand anything at all. It was quite mysterious. And a bit later, uh, probably the same year, we're talking about 1974 now. I mean, it was 75 then in the springtime. There was a Dutch group that wanted to make another documentary. And I went down there with them with the hope of finding uh, limestone caves down there. That limestone was, caves? Yeah, because uh, the, uh, the caves form very readily in limestone. And in fact, there, was, uh, there were numbers of them down there. There were also abandoned mines. And there were just too many places where things could be hidden. It, uh, it wasn't a question of finding the cave or the spot. Uh, there were lots and lots of potential places for hiding a treasure. And by the way, there was no telling what the treasure might have been. It was all quite mysterious. So there were t too many treasures and too many places where it might have been hidden. Mm. There, there are some really interesting caves. I didn't realize um, they were limestone caves, but I I know that th there are some caves like just under Renless Chateau that have this, uh, it looks like a selenite or something along the walls. Are you aware of those? No, 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 no. I got discouraged very early on because I could see there were just too many places down there. It's, uh, <laughs> at, at the very beginning, and even now for some people, uh, there are many ideas of what might be hidden there. Of course, there might be nothing hidden there. And uh, too many places where it might be hidden. And some of them were natural and some of them were man-made. And there was talk of tunnels and... Uh, uh, burial sites, uh, treasure had been buried with the people in question, and uh, it went on and on. And it's the same thing with the literature, with the uh, texts about this. Uh, uh, I've got that uh, 1985 book that you mentioned. It's, uh, it's got about uh, 50 pages, a bit more. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't count the number of, interest, uh, of entries, but there must be six or eight on each page. Uh, so there were two, oh, three, four hundred uh, uh, publications even way back then. That's right. That's what's so amazing. And um, I wanted to ask you, if I could, about some of those individual uh, entries um, that really caught my attention. Uh, actually, first... The, the first thing, you know, of course, uh, you did mention the geometry of the area, which you just mentioned uh, uh, about Henry and uh, that the young girl. I, I wonder who that was. It seems to me like Elizabeth Van Buren had also identified that geometry in the area, but I'm not sure which, what preceded what, who preceded who on that. Um, who do you say identified it? Elizabeth Van Buren. Ah, yes, yes, yes. You remember yes. her? Uh, I, the, uh, the first books of hers that I saw were, uh, were certainly after I had identified the, or the girl had identified the, uh, uh, the star or the five points. It doesn't have to be a star. It's really just five points. That's right. That's right. It certainly is. And, um, but the, uh, the other thing that caught me in the foreword of, of the book was, uh, where you talked about um, you talked about the geometry of the area, and you said accordingly the region was interpreted 
as one of the few terrestrial localities where the ancient hermetic formula for immortality, as it is above, so shall it be below, as above, uh, so below, might apply. Now, you know, we hear that as above, so below, and we hear it applied to Renle Chateau all the time. Now, I don't, I also hear stories about immortality, about uh, raising the dead and, and and other things like that that apply to, to Renle Chateau. But I never realized that as above, so below was a hermetic formula for immortality. It seems to go back a, a very long time. You get things like that uh, worldwide, uh, as above, so below. Uh, de Cherizet, who was... Uh, sort of a uh, sidekick or associate of uh, uh, Pierre Plantaz, and considerably more intelligent and uh, active than Plantaz sometimes, uh, mm. said, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we were dealing with the big question of origins. And I think that's right. Uh, after all, a lot of these things are uh, that come up uh, are linked to the New Testament and, and to the Old Testament. And I think it goes back even earlier than that. I think uh, the as above, so below goes back to the ancient Mesopotamians. So we're dealing with big questions here. We're not just dealing with a, a freaky little subject that nobody understands. Uh, it, uh, it's religious if you want, but it's not necessarily a Christian religion uh, just because uh, the key, key person was a Catholic priest. That's right. That's right. We don't know what it was he found or what he became aware of or, or you know, what his thinking was. Uh, but the idea of this immortality and, you know, the idea of origins, that uh, blew my mind when you just said that, because that's something that I've been looking into in terms of of that region and, tr and trying to get some understanding of that. But that was so interesting there. Now, if I could uh, bring up w another uh, entry about uh, that I read, I think it's on page 39, about um, something about Ren Laban. Uh, it was an entry, and the name of the author is Rabelais, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Francois yes. Rabelais, Gargantua yeah. at Pant Pantagruel. And it says... It mentions uh, Bath at Limons, which uh, it's in parentheses Lemu, but uh, in quotes it says, Rabelais sojourned for a while at Ren le -Ban. His book five gives an exact description of a certain spot which to this day is illuminated by an ever burning light. Uh, that's a citation. But, uh, uh, frankly, I don't know what it refers to, and uh, uh, the matter is such that uh, there are many things here where people are speaking about something, and I've read their texts. Rabelais is exceedingly well known here, and uh, should be known in English, too. And, uh, well, he, he wrote that, and uh, we have to make what we can of it. Uh, the, but uh, I don't know of anyone who's seen that light. I, I don't either, but someone did say that they uh, had heard of it and, and thought it was from another source. So that'll be interesting to to, to follow up on that. I wonder if that um, could possibly be true, and if it is, you know, what kind of a light phenomena that could be. Uh, no, I don't have any information on that. Uh, I know that uh, there's a. Uh, a group here in the Paris area, far to the north of uh, Rennes -le Chateau, that uh, tries to decipher the uh, uh, the mythology, call it French mythology, if you want, uh, in the writings of uh, Rabelais. There's a, an awful lot of stuff in his writings. Uh, this may mean something very uh, significant, but I think that it once again, uh, it's not that we don't have enough information; it's that we've got too much. <laughs> That's it. I believe that it's there's so much to sift through, and it seems like once you pick up a thread and you think you're getting somewhere, then it goes off in another direction. But and then and then everything seems to connect up. So it uh, 
begins to make you a little bit crazy. I've known uh, a few people that it's made just a little bit crazy, and some a lot crazy, living out in the hills. <laughs> <laughs> Intense. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there are some odd ones in, in France here, too, who are really hooked by the subject, yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's captivating. I've, I've sort of been hooked on it myself since uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail was written and published in 1982 and um, just kind of got hold of me, and as it has so many. Uh, and this was all way, way, way pre-Da Vinci Code. So many people have become aware of this region just in the last 10 years uh, because of Dan Brown and his fictional work, The Da Vinci Code, um, which, of course, is, you know, there's some there's a character based on the authors of uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, uh, the Lee Teabing character. Uh, Lee, after Richard Lee, Teabing is an anagram of Bajent, and the character himself is an, uh, an older man with white hair that walks with a cane, and that supposedly is Henry. So uh, he gave a tip of his hat to the three authors. Of course, two of the authors later sued him, uh, so I, I don't know how happy he was with them, but Henry was not one of them. But I noticed that you um, you thank uh, Lee and Bajent in the book. Now, did you spend... Uh, Michael uh, Bajent. Michael that's Bajent. right. Yeah, Lee, uh, but, but Richard Lee and uh, Michael Bajent, I noticed you thanked them. Uh, d did you do a lot of work with them in the, in the region? or? Uh, I had uh, occasion to go to London several times from, uh, from France in those days, and uh, I used to spend uh, evenings any time I was there with, uh, at, uh, at Richard's place. Uh, incidentally, both of those uh, fellows uh, have died now, unfortunately. Yes. And uh, I certainly did plenty of research. I, f I fed them with whatever information I had while I was uh, putting together this uh, this bibliography. Uh, uh, all of us were convinced that there was something substantial going on, but uh, people had different ideas. When they started to write, uh, they really were not quite sure where they were going. They didn't have a, uh, uh, a conclusion or a fundamental theory. They just said it's leading somewhere, and we can either end with saying there's a mystery, or we can end with saying what we think. Absolutely. Now, that um, I, got, I had a chance. I, actually, Richard Lee was the only author that I didn't uh, have an opportunity to get to know, um, but I did spend some time working with Michael Bajent for about a year, and he came to the United States and spent about six months over here in L.A. Uh, working with me and with my uh, producing partner, Bruce Burgess, and um, then later uh, I got a chance, or actually it was kind of during around the same time I met Henry, and you know, of course, I go to the region so much, so I continue to see Henry to this day. So it's been uh, really edifying to know both of them. I'm so sorry I didn't get to meet Richard Lee. But uh, the I don't want to get too far into uh, something else. So I'm going to bring up something um, that won't take too long, I guess, because we're going to be taking a break here in just a few minutes. But there was something um, that I was... Uh, I noticed on uh, page 42, uh, something by St. Louis, and uh, it was uh, La Madeleine, uh, I'll just say it in English, um, Madeleine of the Desert uh, in, of St. Baum in Provence is the name of the, um, of the writing, or I guess it's a book, and something uh, called The Eliad, and it says, your note, I guess, is these outrageous, untranslatable book-length poems full of obscure puns, anagrams, and other wordplays carry a number of unorthodox hidden method messages. These include the suggestion of a special relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene and the idea that French royalty is descended from the children of Mary Magdalene. And I guess we're talking about the so-called Merovingian bloodline uh, that people refer to today as being the bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. But outrageous, untranslatable book-length poems. 
untranslatable because they're full of too many uh, obscure puns and things that it, they just wouldn't translate to English? Uh, that's correct. And uh, in fact, French readers, uh, native French readers, have a lot of trouble with it. It's, uh, it's very nicely written. And there are little things uh, there are, that are straightforward. Uh, uh, Mary is walking in a valley and she's uh, feeling sorry for herself and she's saying, uh, how, will, uh, poor, how will posterity remember poor Mary? And then there's an echo. And the echo uses her word, poor Mary, and it says married, as in married, as though she had been married. Oh. Uh, yeah. Another time he talks about his, uh, his muse, who is Mary Magdalene, and uh, then he gets into uh, grammar, and then he talks about, he uses the grammatical term conjugates, and you can read conjugates any way you want there. And then uh, at the end, he says, and then his grammar lesson turns out to be theological. So the author is quite clearly saying that uh, 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 Mary had uh, been married and that her marriage is a, has a theological uh, sense to it. But Jesus doesn't come in. It's, uh, it's uh, Mary's marriage that he's talking about. Then later on, uh, he doesn't mention the Merovingians as best I know, but there are anagrams. Sometimes you have to read down the edge of the page, too. There are anagrams in there. And uh, he speaks about the kings of France. But he does not specifically mention the Merovingians. But since other people are saying that one bloodline of kings leads into another... Uh, you can understand it that way. That's right. That's right. And, and through several printings at different times, but curiously, the very first edition, the first printing, sat forever before somebody uh, clicked and understood what uh, what he was up to. Wow, isn't that something? And that was originally written or published in 1668. Yes, that's right. He was uh, he was a priest and. Uh, he, uh, I've collected every bit of uh, literature I could on him, uh, and uh, it wouldn't be in the Renle Chateau bibliography because uh, uh, it just isn't. There's no mention of Renle Chateau in it. Uh, the other things, they were about him. And uh, he seems to have met with some sort of unfortunate fate or another one. He goes to a place that's name is uh, uh, coded or not clear, and then he seems to disappear, and a few people talk about uh, his sad fate, but it's not clear what happened. Wow. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another mystery. Yet another uh, mystery. Yes, that's another, well, it's another thread more than another mystery, yes. True. Oh, so I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Another thread to the mystery. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more with John Saul, more with Renless Chateau, and lots of other stuff. So stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Night Vision. I'm your host, Renee Barnett. If you're just joining us, we're talking tonight with geologist, author John Saul. We've been discussing the Renless Chateau mystery and his book, that was actually published in 1985, which is a bibliography, Renle Chateau, a bibliography. And it's it's a wonderful, it's a must-have for any Ren researcher, I'm telling you right now. And you can get it if you go to tomebooks2.com online. You can That's John's uh, website, and you can see that book and his other books, which we're going to be talking about, too, uh, in just a moment. But, well, John, the questions have started to come in uh, from the chat and other areas, and I'm going to try to ask you one that Sandy Hamlet has has uh, put to you, uh, if I don't slaughter the, the name. Uh, she says, Renee, ask John if he knows where, is it Beignet got the info about the tomb of Jesus in the Renle Chateau area? Sorry, I'm not sure what uh, the name is that the, the 
person you're talking about there. I know Sandy. Hi, Sandy. The but spelling is B E G N E T. B E G N E T. Is it Benet or? What's the first letter there? B as in boy. Benny. That's what it looks uh, like to me. Benny. No, I don't think. Uh, I think that's a dead end. I don't recognize that. Huh. Okay. Well, Sandy's in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's probably something. Uh, something maybe more she'll. Specific. Maybe as we go forward, maybe she'll give me a little bit more information, and um, I'll bring it up later a little bit in the show if uh, if she has some clarification for us on that. Um, well, court uh, it asked me. He sent this to me earlier, and he said, "Ask your guest if he sees any connection between Plantart and Gizors." I found recently a man referred to as Plantar of Jesus, uh, that is directly related to the Delators and other powerful families. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's uh, Pierre Planta all over again. Uh, let me go into some detail of what I, I think was uh, Planta's uh, source and. Uh, uh, it explains part of the reason why everything's so confusing. Uh, Planta started off life as a uh, uh, young man at the beginning of uh, World War II. He was definitely some sort of collaborator in favor of the Nazis. And uh, he had already written uh, the French president, uh, or the equivalent of the prime minister then, uh, say, offering help uh, to fight this Masonic uh, plot. He was anti-Mason, anti-Freemason. And when the war came, one of the mysteries of World War II, the Nazis paid a fellow terrible man named Henry A. Coston, C-O-S-T-O-N, a matchup. And what a team, Mike. Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and an unlimited LTE plan and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for $0. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas, plus sales tax. Claim based on talk and text. Not valid for active numbers currently on the T Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past 90 days. See store for details and terms and conditions. They uh, paid him uh, 20,000 marks or francs, I don't know, to a month to collect, to confiscate all sorts of uh, Masonic uh, documents throughout France. And uh, he more or less filled up a room with, the, or a building perhaps, with confiscated documents. But he couldn't get people to help him sort them through because if you said that you were familiar with uh, Masonic information, you became a suspect, and you were likely to be arrested. About 6,000 uh, Masons were arrested and questioned during, uh, during the war in France. And uh, Planta was an exception. He was inoculated, if you wish, because he had a copy of his letter uh, saying that the war was part of a Masonic plot. And Planta lived a uh, five to ten minute walk, not no, not ten minutes, less than that, away from this building where uh, the confiscated documents have been. And I am, uh, I am uh, quite convinced that Planta helped himself to some of the documents, and that those documents mentioned Ben Le Chateau, and they also mentioned Giza. And he arranged for a, uh, a archaeological dig, a proper dig, I believe. I'm not sure, but somebody went digging in Giza, and they came up with nothing at all. And uh, after coming up with nothing in Giza, the attention switched to Ren Le Chateau and Ren Le Bain. Wow. So we don't know what. I think that's the ultimate source. Of, uh, of much of what we're aware of, uh, documents that were stolen and uh, confiscated, confiscated first and stolen afterwards. And I don't mind uh, uh, labeling uh, Planta as somebody who would steal things. Uh, after all, he'd been in jail three different times for three different defenses. Hmm. 
Well, that's true. And yep. now, what what is your opinion of Plantard after having researched him so thoroughly? Well, I think he learned quite a lot as time went by that he used his uh, friend uh, Philippe de, de Cherizet as a crutch. De Cherizet was obviously uh, a very bright individual. He, uh, uh, he showed up on uh, television, and we're talking about black and white television. This is a while back. He showed up on television. Uh, he was very quick on the uptake. And uh, he also punned, but uh, he saw a lot of these documents before uh, Planta decided what he was going to show and what he wasn't going to show. And, uh, uh, he came to the conclusion that we're dealing with something serious and that we're dealing with this question of uh, origins. And I believe that's, that's what's going on here. I think that we're talking about a bloodline that goes way, way, way back. Uh, uh, most people are familiar with the story of biblical bloodlines. I certainly think that's... Uh, that's involved, and I think it may go back even earlier to Mesopotamian times, to the the whole notion of sacred kings, uh, you know, putting out the red carpet for the king and uh, and uh, treating him as if he was uh, sacred because he was considered to be sacred, and that comes right down through the uh, the uh, the two biblical books, uh, the. Uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, all over again. Well, speaking of you know these these bloodlines and origins, uh, you you hear in 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 the patriarchs and you know biblical times, we've heard stories of of, of a possible you know necropolis in the area. One of the legends is you know the 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 bodies of the patriarchs were. Were brought, were brought there. Um, has your research uh, brought anything up about some sort of a necropolis and a connection with the with the patriarchs? No, 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 no. The uh, references I have, and I think they're conversations I had with people, not, not uh, published. I can't can't remember anything published. Published as I published as a reference to a. Uh, Necropolis, that's for sure. But the people I spoke to, uh, and this is not me speaking, this is a citation, uh, were, were thinking that it would be the, the children of Mary Magdalene. Yes. Well, that makes sense with the other uh, stories in the area. But going back to Sandy's question, it was a typo. It was, it was Michael Bajant. That she was ah talking. yes, okay. So, what was the question about Michael then? Uh, Asked John if he knows where Michael Bajant got the information about the tomb of Jesus in the RLC area. Oh gosh, uh, he would have mentioned that to me, but he would have mentioned that to me, but I I can't recall. Uh, I can't recall uh, what he might have said about that. Uh, he spoke about the tomb of Jesus, definitely. I had a tendency to uh, disagree. There's nothing, certainly in uh, in the New Testament, that suggests that. Uh, I can see. I don't recall. I don't recall his sauce on that. Maybe Michael's. Maybe it's Michael's uh, own idea there. As I said, the poor man is it no longer. It might have been some person. kind of a conclusion, you know, that he came to, based on, you know, other other pointers or something like that. Yeah, the Sherry Zay spoke about the the arrival of uh, Mary Magdalene uh, in the area, but uh, the timing was sloppy. Uh, uh, he would have been referring to. Mary Magdalene taking care of her children, but uh, the children would have already been past the age of 30. Uh, the, the, the chronology, the timing, the dates didn't work out because uh, the confounding thing is that uh, Mary Magdalene is supposed to live in an area there at Saint-Baume, which you mentioned early on. 
Right. Uh, she was supposed to have lived there for uh, 30 years. And this, it, it, it just doesn't work out. The number of years don't, don't work out. St. Bohm, uh, you mentioned uh, in the title of the uh, poem of uh, Pierre de Saint Louis, which is That's right. so complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The untranslatable one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, um, so, yeah, you do hear the stories about, you know, her coming to shore at St. Baum, St. Maxim and St. Baum. And, um, but you also hear a lot of stories in the region. And I've talked to just locals, you know, who say, oh, well, of course she was here. And so were the children and they played in the meadow. And, you know, it, it's just taken for granted by some people. Uh, in that area that Mary Magdalene was living there. So have you uh, uncovered any evidence of that outside of just legend? Well, uh, sorry, we, we both got something wrong for a moment there. She comes ashore at Saint Marie de la Mer. Uh, oh. That's Saint in plural, saints, plural saints of, right. of the sea. Saint de la Mer. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and then she goes inland to uh, St. Bohm. Uh, I would say it's uh, one of these stories uh, that uh, uh, we just all sort of know here in France, but uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, is elusive. I mean, uh, did uh, George Washington throw the silver dollar across the river or didn't he? Uh, lots of people have heard the story, but that doesn't make it either more true or less true. I'm going to say no. <laughs> you have to say no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Was it across the Potomac? I'm not sure how wide that river is, but maybe he was at a very, very narrow part. But I'm going to say probably not. <laughs> but, oh, goodness. But did Mary Magdalene come to France? Is that something provable? Is that something that is accepted? Uh now, I mean, because I remember when I first started getting into this and doing programs about uh, this story, and people would say, oh, they couldn't have come to France. How could they get there? And I'm saying, well, you know, it's really not that far. It's And people did it all the time, you know. And when they think about, you know, uh, back then, you know, we didn't hear about France and the Bible, but we heard about Gaul, and which is that area. So they could have easily uh, come across there. But what is the real evidence? Do you know? I think it's the same problem you have uh, with, uh, with the readers of the Bible. Uh, some people take it literally, and they've got no doubts. And other people uh, say, gosh, uh, it could be true, and you've got people who say it's just a story. It, uh, I don't think it's any more resolvable than overall questions of religion where people have different views. True, maybe so. I mean, some things can be sort of historically proven and counted on, you know, but uh, these stories are all so elusive. It, it, it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint. But it would be nice to know, um, you know, I doubt very seriously if she could have spent 30 years in um, in the St. Baum area and then spent any time at all in um, southwest France in the Languedoc region. Uh, it would seem like, like you said, the timing would be all skewed. Now... I wanted there's, to ask there's another thing from the Cherise. Uh, he uh, he ties the departure from uh, from the Holy Land as uh, uh, the year seventy, and uh, that's what gets the timing all wrong. Now, if if the Cherise, who had access to whatever documents uh, Plantin had obtained, if the Cherise, if the number the year seventy is de Cherizet's, uh imagination or his, his general idea rather than what's in the do the documents that Plantin saw, then maybe the whole thing would would fit. But we're given one date, which is the year 70, and that's what throws all the chronology out. If de Cherizet got it wrong, uh, then maybe all of this does make sense. Hmm. That, that, that could be. Now, you know, if it's true that, you know, Philip, 
Philippe de Cherse was really kind of the brains of the outfit. Why is it that, you know, Pierre Plantard is the one that's always out front? You know, he's always, you know, we see him listed as, you know, Grandmaster of the Priory of Zion. Uh, is it because he is in the so-called bloodline? Well, he's clearly not in the bloodline. De Cherizé had no doubts about that. Uh, Plantard uh, made himself a candidate for... Uh, uh, descendant of Jesus, or King of France, or yep. I don't know what. He, he lived a fantasy world. Uh, the Cherise had, in a way, you could say he had his feet on the ground, but he was a joker. He, uh, uh, he didn't care if he had the facts right or wrong, but he was interested in learning the facts, and then he'd tell you what he felt like telling you on that particular day. But but he, he was serious. What was yeah. the purpose? Ah, uh, Plantin's purpose was in uh, the reign of uh, fantasy, or uh, he thought he'd become king of France, or should become king of France, and uh, uh, perhaps he thought that the justification was that he was descended from uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or perhaps because he was descended from... Uh, uh, the kings themselves, and he produced these very long, complicated genealogies, which he could not have done on his own. He just wasn't up to it. And so he got that either from the documents I referred to, the so-called Masonic uh, Horde, or uh, from some other source. But he, he was given a bunch of documents, and then he reworked the genealogies. Now, so he he wrote himself into the bloodline. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Oh uh, that, they, that was a lifetime project for him. Yes, and uh, but then you have to look at the genealogies, and you learn an awful lot of things from the footnotes there, and little references he has. Uh, there will be a little reference saying, uh, we have to correct this, uh, such and such was not the nephew of so and so, he was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, what's, uh, I can't think of the term now, but the nephew's uh, son or a nephew once removed, one generation farther down the line, the great nephew. Mm. And uh, uh, he puts detail and detail and detail there, but... Uh, Gerard de Sede, who wrote about this in, in French at considerable length and who knew Plantard very well, Plantard was almost the co-author, said uh, all it takes is to fiddle one line on a, a genealogy and everything that follows is wrong. Yeah, exactly. That is so true. That is so true. We've, my family's been working on their genealogy and it's... It's not easy. It's difficult. And if you get off on one thing, then, you know, everything after that or before that, rather, is 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 wrong. Yeah, it's just a break. And you've got two documents instead of one. One of them may be valid and the other one definitely isn't. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, do you think that uh, Plantard had anything to do with uh, the planting of uh, the dossier secret? In the oh, bibliotheque. Yes. Oh, yes, that's his work. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a copy of it or just references to it, but if you see the copy, yes, it's, I have. It's very neatly put down on paper. And uh, Planta had been trained as a draftsman. I don't think it was his original training, I think it came later on, after, well after the war. He became a draftsman. And uh, that's really one of the ways that you can identify his documents by their, the neatness of uh, the original document and then little scribbles. His handwriting wasn't that good. He used a, a lettering guide and then little scribbles in the margins where he added other things on some of the documents. That's true. That's true. There are some little... And I've seen... Um, you know, some different markings on some different uh, different copies of it. So I think some people have been adding their own little marks, but uh, I believe I have a copy of the of the original that just has uh, whoever the author's markings were. Now, was that the was that Laudacia Secret that were uh, that 
that were supposedly uh, had the name of Henri Lobano. Uh, the Lobano documents are uh, a planter. They are. Yeah. Uh, there's a link to the Church of uh, Saint Sulpice in uh, in France. Yep. And Lobino is just, uh, it's named after somebody, it's a real person, but uh, Lobino is the name of the, a street that goes by the church, that's how he got the name, that's all there is uh, there, that's you don't right. have to worry yeah. about Lobino. <laughs> don't have to try to track him down. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Now, no were, did you ever meet uh, Plantart or, or Desheresy? No, never met either one of them. I stayed away from Planta, and I tried to contact the Cherise, but I wasn't uh, successful. I see. And yeah. did they remain uh, friends to the end? No, no, no. It broke down near the end. Uh, there were supposed meetings, and I believe that these meetings never took place. They were just uh, Planta writing the account of a meeting, and the Cherise was upset that he wasn't invited to them. But of course, he wouldn't have been invited if there was no meeting anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. I wondered whether or not, in the end, you know, there was any resentment by the Cherise about uh, Plantard sort of getting all the attention. Or if at the time, maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe that's only been in subsequent decades that it's sort of become, you know, Pierre, everyone knows the name Pierre Plantart. Fewer people know who Philippe de Cherise was. I think that what happened is that de Cherise felt that he was being played for a fool. Yeah. Oh, so do you think that he was actually believing what Plantard was was saying or, or giving him uh, it, at first and then later became sort of disenchanted? Early on, uh, the Cherise certainly thought there was something going on in uh, Rennes Chateau. We went down there with Plantard. They were both young men. Uh, that would have been the 1950s, though I believe Plantard had actually, or maybe early 60s, I believe Plantard had actually been there in uh, 1949. Because if he had uh, helped himself to these documents, uh, and I'm quite sure that he had, uh, uh, he, uh, he would have known about uh, René Chateau as far back as 1942 during the war, but people were not going on little excursions during the war. Mm. And of course he had no money. He, he never had uh, much money. So uh, traveling and uh, recording apparatus and things of that sort uh, uh, were not readily available to him. The Cherizet's family uh, uh, was wealthy. The Cherizet himself was not for a variety of reasons. There were family problems there. And uh, sometimes he was in the funds. Also, he worked for a living. He was an actor. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, Planta used his funds uh, very regularly from uh, 1960 or 62 or thereabouts. 60, mm. 62, I think. Yeah. yeah. And um, a big question just before we go to break. Do you believe there is an organization called the Priory of Zion? I believe that Pierre Planta founded such an organization and did not attract anyone of great interest or importance. Uh, he founded a number of earlier groups, and uh, one of them for which he claimed 3,200 members or something like that actually had four members. And the, uh, the actually and the four members was because uh, the, but was brought to the attention of the police and they investigated it. And they said there were four members. <laughs> there may have been such an organization, but I don't think it had the scope that uh, anyone has in mind. And, and, and the, biggest, the biggest question, you don't think that it predated Pierre Plantard? No, but... In the documents that he had access to, there were certainly other uh, organizations going way back, 
either to the time of the Crusades or to the early 19th century or both that had the word uh, Zion in them. Mm. Um, Planta was a, a town called Animas, which is right on the uh, border with Switzerland for a while. Mm -hmm. That's where he got his training and his work as a uh, draftsman. And there's a uh, mountain pass called the, the, uh, Zion. Called, uh, called the Monsignon there. He said he named the group after that. Uh, I, I think that's what he said, but I don't think it's the truth. Mm. Yeah. So he, he admitted that he named the group? Could you say that again? He admitted that he had named the group. In other words, there was no oh, ancient I group called. I have admitted anything. No, I think that. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, things get uh, uh, dug up and uh, brought to the surface by other people. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so he never really uh, fessed up to anything. He he went to his grave with his stories, I guess. I think so, but he started out as uh, uh, anti-Masonic and anti-Semitic, and later on he said that his group contained uh, contained Jews. A confusing sort there. Yeah, wasn't he part of the Vichy uh, political movement uh, there in France? I mean, I, I remember that he was connected with something sort of right-wing... And, uh, well, uh, yes, before the war, extreme. he definitely involved with uh, uh, right-wing organizations, and one of the tricks of those organizations was to produce documents that seemed to be okay, uh, but by people who had died shortly before and couldn't confirm them. And Planta kept up with that for decades after the right-wing uh, saw that it uh, wasn't really a... a a way to move forward that people were onto their trick, but Planta never realized he couldn't get away with it. He did that perhaps six or eight times, maybe more. Wow, that's interesting. You know, we're going to have to take another break, and then we will be coming into our final half hour with our guest tonight, John Saul, author and geologist, American Living in Paris. Hang on, and we'll be right back. If you're listening to Night Vision Radio, I'm Renee Barnett, your host. With me tonight is geologist and author John Saul. He's joining us from Paris tonight or this morning for him, and uh, we sure appreciate that. I want to refer you to John's website. It is Tome Book Two, T O M E Book Two dot com, and that's the number two. Uh, look at his books on there now, John. I took up so much time with Renle Chateau. We didn't really get into <laughs> into your other books, um, but also now I know that you've got the manuscript done. I believe for uh, for your new book. Does have you titled it yet? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I called it a, an extra player on the playing field of history. I think that what. So we're talking about the same thing. You refer to the bloodline. Yeah. Uh, but I think that we have people popping up now and then, and maybe every generation, is, for all I know, who uh, believe in the bloodline, and uh, they don't all believe it's precisely the same bloodline. I tried to identify the one that uh, Planta uh, was tuned into. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, I'm not a uh, believer in uh, in big conspiracies, but I'm believe certainly a believer in small conspiracies, and I think that there have been a series of uh, small conspiracies about royalty and who has the rights to rule, and uh, uh, Merovingian or descent from Jesus, uh, bloodline going all the way back, or remember mm. Pierre Pontar referred to the. Uh, the uh, tribe of, uh, of uh, Benjamin, uh, the royalty from that tribe, too. And uh, I think this has activated people all through the ages. And once again, it's the idea of as above, so below, that uh, if you belong to the right bloodline or the chosen of heaven, uh, you have the right to rule. 
That's, that's, a, that's a big question that I, in itself. It's really quite odd. Uh, if you look at the animal world, you, you might have a leader, but you don't have somebody who rules as such. Uh, very strange that uh, somebody might have the right to rule over people who he's never even met. You know, it is. And, you know, I have a, I have a lot of friends um, from Europe and, and from the UK, which is no longer part of the European Union or won't be soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and who've been, you know, much more used to the idea of royalty, of, of kings and queens. And, you know, growing up in America, uh, we just, you know, we don't have that model here. You know, it's like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, you know, make it on your own. And, and that's the most admirable thing or, or, or it or seems like it should be. Uh, so we don't have that idea of entitlement or, you know, sort of royalty and, and, and below stairs people in, in that concept. Um, and maybe for that reason, I, I sort of, you know, I've always had an aversion to that idea that, you know, a person ruling over other people or being sort of somehow better than other people. But could, could there really be something different uh, about these bloodlines? And when you talk about origins, are you talking about origins uh, of us as, as humans about the origins of mankind? Um, no, I and, think uh, uh... First of all, uh, I think that's a, a very valid uh, subject for, for research, uh, and I'm working on yet another book on that. Ooh. But uh, no, I'm talking about the origins of uh, civilization, maybe with a capital C, which I think starts out a high culture, high civilization in Mesopotamia that's uh, directed by a, by a king. Now. Uh, that's one of the things that George Washington definitely wanted to get away from. Uh, he uh, he refused to uh, uh, to be a candidate for a third term. I read somewhere, not sure that uh, it's necessarily true, but uh, the idea is interesting in any case. Uh, somebody wrote that the uh, the family history, the genealogy that has been most researched in the whole world was that of George Washington, because the Brits wanted to say, well, of course, uh, a matchup. And what a team, Mike. Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and an unlimited LTE plan and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for $0. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas, plus sales tax. Claim based on talk and text. Not valid for active numbers currently on the T Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past 90 days. See store for details and terms and conditions. Uh, you still got the king. He's the 14th cousin of uh, of the present king, or something along those lines. And you really haven't broken away from us. But uh, we did break away from the from the uh, from the British royal line. Uh, we definitely did. And George Washington was not royalty, and that's just the way he wanted it to be. Yeah, and I think that I mean I think that is sort of admirable when. You know, he probably had the opportunity to uh, lord it over people <laughs> a little bit more if he hadn't believed that way. But also, then he would have been uh, subject to the king. So there you go. Uh, it behooved him to think that way, I guess. But well, it's uh, I think that's that, what that the idea Revolution was all about. Yep, that's right. That's absolutely right. But that idea of entitlement, you know, I think, you know, we. Uh, or at least I have sort of a knee-jerk reaction, you know, to that whole idea. And, um, I mean, it, it kind of smacks of, you know, what the Nazis were doing, you know, uh, lording it over other races, you know, or uh, other races being inferior, that sort of thing. I've always had a little bit of a problem with that that kind of thinking, too. So, but could it be that there is something different uh, about, this bloodline or 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 any of 
bloodlines that might be referred to in different cultures or in different times. But let's say this bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, is it possible that there's something about their DNA that's special or what would be the deciding factor? How would people know, you know, that you're the special one? Well, I think that's a that's a very interesting thing. But instead of speaking about uh, Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene, or others in the other kings in the New Testament times and Old Testament times, uh, let's go back to uh, uh, the origin of kingship. And on these uh, clay tablets that were inscribed that have been found in Mesopotamia, there's a reference, and it says, "When kingship was lowered from heaven." And uh, it's never clarified. They don't clarify what that means. So I think that your question has maybe 5% of an answer. <laughs> uh, it was lowered from heaven. And uh, it may be. Unfortunately, there's a war going on in that part of the world now. Uh, it may be that uh, more tablets will be found and translated. Maybe they're already untranslated in, in the uh, archives of the British Museum or the Louvre here, and they'll throw a bit of light on it. Now, I don't think that it was a secret. I think this was one of those things that was so well known. I think everybody knew it in those days because it was the foundation of civilization and government. Everybody knew what the king was and how he became royal. Well, he was lowered from heaven. And <laughs> it was just one of those things like we're speaking prose and we're breathing air, but nobody ever gets around to saying it. Uh, but maybe not. But I think the only way to get anywhere near an answer to your question is to get more translations of these uh, cuneiform tablets from various uh, ancient languages. Well, true. Absolutely. Absolutely true. Do you have any opinion at all, um, speaking of cuneiform tablets, uh, of um, the idea about, you know, uh, people visiting, you know, ancient aliens, ancient astronauts coming to Earth and and intermingling with what were human women at that time? Do you have any opinion about some of those ideas that have come from some of those translations. And, you know, some of those translations could probably be read in a different way as well. I, uh, I'm fundamentally against that line of thinking. Uh, first of all, the, the only information that you get, that you receive, comes from people and sources that really they've made it up or they've misconstrued something. There's no information uh, that indicates uh, that there were ancient astronauts. Uh, uh, there's lots of mistranslations and a lot of bad faith also. No, I, I don't accept that at all. Uh, I was going to say one more thing. Yes, the nature of kingship. I had an idea. There's, I've got no source for this whatever. Absolutely no source whatever. But uh, my idea was, just looking at people coming from the Middle East, I wonder if the original king, the very first king, is supposedly lowered from heaven, wasn't a blonde or a redhead that suddenly arrived, either genetically or just a traveler, amongst all these people, the Iranians, uh, the Arabs, the Jews, who in the Middle East... Not anymore these days because there's too much mixture, but uh, have dark hair. And I wondered if the king might not have been uh, a blonde coming from the north or a redhead with a genetic uh, uh, arrangement uh, from his parents somehow. And uh, I rather like that idea because the red hair can be red as blood and the blonde can be as uh, as bright as the sun or something along those lines. But or gold. That, that's me speaking. That's not somebody else. That, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting way to look at it. You know, we hear so much about the red-haired kings. Um, 
you know, before we get to the end of the show, I want to talk a little bit about your um, other books that are on your website, The Tale Told in All Lands. And I have a feeling some of this uh, that we're talking about is probably connected. I know, um, you know, I haven't had a chance to to get this book yet, but uh, you talked about uh, how we're still connected to our ancestors through DNA, of course. Uh it's not the DNA I emphasize, it's uh, the cultural thing, the, this whole, I mean, believing in kings or the sacredness of kings is not DNA. Uh, and uh, the bloodline is necessarily DNA, but we know that these beliefs exist, but we don't know if the bloodline exists. Uh, uh, you make a very good case for that, and a lot of other people have made a good case for this uh, bloodline. Uh, uh, I'm very tempted to think that uh, they were offspring of uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, it may not be true, but uh, how about the next generations? Are there any survivors uh, coming down the line? Or After all, uh, they say half of Europe is descended from uh, related to Charlemagne, and this is even going back further. I think that it'd make uh, an awful lot of us uh, carrying the blood of uh, of Jesus if the story was true. Well, you know, as a matter of fact, when I was uh, doing my film called Bloodline, uh, we interviewed uh, a mathematician, statistician. I can't remember. I want to say he was from MIT. I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, he had written a book uh, about that. It included uh, an entry about if there was indeed a uh, bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, who would be in it today? And his answer, he figured out statistically, would be almost everyone. Yes. So now, who's the who's the king? <laughs> you know? Well, and I, I think would imagine I be, that problem. <laughs> I would imagine there'd be people that were more uh, directly in the bloodline than others or so maybe they contain whoever contains the most royal dna maybe maybe that's it uh, i uh that that corresponds to my thinking incidentally i went to mit too but i'm not your source on that one <laughs> no you're not my source on that one and maybe i just uh, psychically picked up on that from you <laughs> it seems like that's where he was from i'm going to have to look up that source though i can't and i i apologize to that gentleman because i can't remember his name at the moment that's been probably a dozen years ago when we interviewed him but um also your book um uh, your other book online, as, as a geologist speculates on gemstones, origins of gas and oil, moon-like impact scars on the earth, the emergence of animals, and cancer. Yes. What, what a laundry list there of, of, of disparate things. It, are it, isn't such, it isn't such a laundry list. Uh, what you have... Uh, I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. But it just seemed like a, a, a disparate sort of animals, gemstones, and cancer, you know, sort of different things. And um, it's interesting how you uh, are addressing the emergence of all these things uh, coming on the earth. But but go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. The, uh, the key thing to know, and you learn it uh, more or less in your first course in geology, but never, not everybody has had a first course in geology, is you get through 80% of the history of the Earth uh, before you get complex animals. For the first 80%, things are either single-celled or they're colonial uh, creatures, uh, just masses like algae and uh, uh, the sort of stuff you might find on the se seashore. But the uh, uh, the animals that uh, creep and crawl uh, to pure Darwinism now and into uh, larger creatures, including uh, including humans, uh, their ancestors can only be traced back for the last twenty percent of uh, it's called the Cambrian explosion when suddenly all sorts of types of life uh, came about. Now, these types of life, complicated ones, are made of tissues or tissues and organs. And when you think about it, you can't get cancer if you're a single-celled creature. You've got to be complex. It's, uh, cancer is a disease of tissues and organs and things that break down. So 
I moved into uh, into cancer quite easily from the origins of uh, of complex animals, and it just so happens that the origins of complex animals they just show up in the geological uh, record as fossils at the same time that certain gemstones do so it's uh, the wow. the events that caused the first gemstones to uh, be crystallized and the first complex animals to appear are linked in time and i tried to show how they're linked in logic also wow so it's not a really a disparate list is it it's that they're there actually, there is a connection there between all those things, even though oh, it yeah. didn't sound like it from first glance. Yeah. Now, that's when, the verb on the back of the book to make it sell, uh, and then you say, "How can they be related to one another?" But of course, they are that's related. That's it. To one yeah. yeah. Now, when you talk about the origin of of, of complex animals um, and organisms on the Earth. Uh, do you address the idea of uh, panspermia at all? No, no, I don't think, I think that's, it's not pseudoscience. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable idea, uh, but I think at this stage it's unprovable. And uh, I don't think a scientist who works on that at this stage uh, is really advancing science very much. Uh, it's just too early. I think we'll need another one, two, three, 15 generations of scientists before we can uh, get to that, uh, make sense of that panspermia idea. It could be very valid. It could certainly be valid. In, in your book, uh, what do you, do you have an idea of, of how that happened during that Cambrian explosion? What about that do you think yes. caused? Yes, oh. I think uh, I, I get into some very simple chemistry to put together some very complex uh, uh, molecules. It's the, the molecules of the collagen family. And uh, they, uh, I think it's the manufacture of collagen that causes cells to get stuck to one another. After all, collagen's the stuff they used to make glue out of. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, these single-celled creatures got stuck to one another, and then they had to make do with that situation. I think that's where we come from. With a lot more details to that, of course. Wow. And yeah. what about the, you know, human intelligence that came once once uh, human beings came into existence? Oh, that's a, that's that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, well, if you go, that's that's that question that uh, the, uh, the the origin of language, which is very closely related to it, yes. and uh, it generated so much heat in the uh, French scientific society that uh, the uh, the academy that uh, they said that people were not no longer allowed to discuss it. <laughs> but uh, there are, there are definitely there's definitely an answer there. But uh, which which answer is the correct one? Yeah. That's right. That's what right. was the first conversation? The first two people who ever spoke to each other. What were they talking about? <laughs> exactly. Uh, probably food. No, no. I think it was death. What are we going to do about death? Oh yeah. <laughs> How are we going to avoid it? Because an awful lot of animals get their food without talking about it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, well, zebras don't have to talk. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, oh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, back to the original subject of Renless Chateau. Now, when was the last time you spent time down there? Oh, I haven't been down there for 15 years, maybe even 15 years, let's say now. Uh, I think the most, in myself, I, I sent you an email on this. I'm at the point where I've stopped checking various things in the field. I'd like to go down there and look at the bookshops again. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I hope you I hope you can make it down in May. That would be fabulous. I know Sandy would love to see you, as I would. And there'd probably be lots of people there um, that would like to hear what you have to say. So we'll see if we can spirit you and Muriel down there. That's that's a tempting idea. I don't know if we can make it. Uh, 
aside from everything else, we juggle grandchildren. But uh, it's a very tempting idea. I think anyone who gets a, anyone who thinks about it should really get down there at least once. Oh, absolutely. And then I always warn everybody, once you go, you're going to come back. You know, yes. Nobody goes there just one time. I don't know how many times I've been there, but uh, a large number of times, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does tend to draw you back. It does tend to draw you back. But uh, oh, it's been so great uh, you joining us tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I know the hour is horrendous there. Yeah, but it's, it's been five fifty-five here. Now I'm looking forward to your new book coming out. And as I was saying to you, uh, I know your uh, publisher is in Paris, and I would love to see your books be published in America. So we're going to be putting out the word on that. So if anybody has any ideas, let me know. And um, I would love to see that happen, because I think that you uh, have a whole audience over here that hasn't been widely exposed to your material. I know I hadn't, and I'm so happy that I... uh, ran across it well thanks to sandy hamlet who uh suggested that you come on my show and i'm so happy that she did and i'm so thrilled to have this little ren le chateau a bibliography that you wrote because i'm just going to refer to it over and over again i've already marked it up it looks pathetic already (laughs) sorry about that I didn't want to do that, but then I thought, what the heck? It's it's a I'm going to work with this book. This is it's not a reference just a, book. That's right, absolutely, and I think it's very necessary for anybody that's interested in this study. I think you're going to find some interesting things there that you haven't come across before. But uh, uh, thanks to you, and thanks to Sandy, both of you. Many thanks. Well, you're certainly welcome, and I know Sandy. Uh, has been in the chat room tonight and uh, I know she was so happy that you agreed to come on. So I'm really pleased about that, but I want to mention one more time. We're getting ready to close the show, but mention one more time uh, the big meetup in Renless Chateau the first week of May. Uh, We're asking all putting out the call to all Ren buffs, researchers, authors, Uh, filmmakers, whoever's interested in the subject. uh, We're inviting everybody to come over around the first week of May, and we're going to be having a few events lined up, some film screenings, and hopefully some presentations if uh, it looks like the response is going to be big. I know every time I go there, I'm always flabbergasted that I always run into someone I know from some other country or from America that I did not realize was going to be there, but I'll be walking through the garden um, in Renless Chateau in the uh, Jardin de Marie restaurant, and I'll hear someone yell out my name, and I'll go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. And it usually happens with a lot of synchronicity, but I thought, well, what if we purposely all tried to get there at the same time and it would be a good opportunity for us all to sit down and exchange ideas and a lot of us are researching one little bit or one little part of the mystery and uh, no one has time to research the whole thing because that would take your whole life and more so anyway hope you can make it and john saul i really appreciate it apologies to your lovely wife that we got you both up at such a crazy time, but we sure appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and good night, everybody.
Game matchup. And what a team, Mike. Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and an unlimited LTE plan and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for $0. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas, plus sales tax. Claim based on talk and text. Not valid for active numbers currently on the T Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past 90 days. See store for details.